Perfect. Um, so I uh, would love to see if we can do a round of introductions to meet Carol. Um, and I'm sorry if you guys have all done this while you were waiting for no, me. Really. Um, but so on our agenda, we've got, yeah, introductions, review and approve the agenda, which is what we're going to be doing right now, um, public comments, uh, review and approve meeting minutes, uh, self-education and learning roundtable, report backs from city, related city committees. I think that's really just looking at you, Michael, and maybe Cameron, if there's any update from the budget. Um, and then creative discourses work plan update. Uh, so how the outreach to affinity groups is going, we'll, handing that over to Michael to review your document. Um, affinity group meeting scheduling, um, and also got a request for a fundraising update. So I can just do a quick there too. Um, and then other po other business of um, checking in on protests and, and policing in particular. Um, a website updates was another um, message and then rescheduling our meeting. So how has it been two weeks? I feel like what is, I'm, what is Ty? I like have done nothing since we talked last and yet there is a very, very full agenda. So um, anything else to change or to add here? What did you add to uh, the creative discourse? I had the outreach, affinity groups, funding, fundraising, protests. That's it. What, what? Other business, uh, protests and website. Oh. And we want to add um, um, meeting time. And meeting time there. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so hi, Carol. I'm Shana. I'm the uh, <laughs> the chair. I'm basically I'm the on the bossy pants, and uh, I don't know if I do much else. I live on Kent Street, and I do community organizing with community groups fighting pollution threats in their neighborhoods um, for my work, and also do a lot of work to get women elected into office with Emerge Vermont. Um, Michael, do you want to go next? Okay, I'm Michael Sherman. Um, I'm the I'm the unofficial the official unofficial note taker for the for the committee. Um, I'm retired, but I'm the, but I continue as the editor of Vermont History, the journal of the Vermont Historical Society, and um, occasionally I am a baker at uh, the the Mangies Bakery. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to go? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jeremy Beaudry, resident on Elm Street uh, in Montpelier, of course. Um, I work for the UVM Medical Center um, doing kind of patient experience design um, and quality improvement type projects. Um, fairly new to the committee. I think I joined in November. Um, still finding my way, but happy to be here. I can go next if it is okay. I'm Pelin Cohn. Um, I live in Montpelier and work for Norwich University. I never like driving in the snow to Northfield, <laughs> although it's a very nice route, right? I take Route 12. Mm -hmm. But I'm so happy doing remote teaching uh, <laughs> this semester. But I miss my students too. So, and I have been working. Um, in this community since last year. So nice to meet you. Cameron, do you want to go? Then we'll have Cameron. Sure. Carol go. Awesome. Uh, just for the record, my name is Cameron Niedermeyer. I am the assistant city manager and staff support for this group. And I know Carol. So over to you, Carol. <laughs> over to you, Carol. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, Carol, Carol Plant. CJC. Yeah, I'm the director of the Community Justice Center, and um, I actually live in Jeffersonville, and I also, in the winter, am really enjoying working remotely. Um, I'm just in Montpelier one day a week right now um, for the foreseeable future, too. We're doing everything remotely. Um, and I, I decided to come. I've been wanting to come to this meeting be, just because I have an interest in, you know, what you... Um, are going to be talking about and working on, and to see if it's um, if it's helpful for me to um, attend the meetings and just learn more about what's happening, and and if if that's going to inform our work in some way, or if I can be a resource for your committee um, when you're planning your work. So I'm happy to meet all of you, and um, I look forward to learning. 
Could you share a bit more about what the Community Justice Center does? I'd like to learn more. Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for the elevator speech. Um, <laughs> so we do um, restorative justice process for, um, basically the focus is to help people be accountable when they commit offenses and crimes. And we, we center the practice on the needs of the people who are affected in, and we include the community in that. So um, people who are referred and they're referred in many different ways, they, um, they meet with a panel of community volunteers. So it's usually between three and five people. They talk about the decisions and actions that led them to having a, a charge um, or you know whatever the offense was, and then they find ways to to make things right. They hopefully gain a better understanding of how their decisions and actions affected others, and then they write up an agreement um, that basically addresses how they're going to fix things, how they're going to um, avoid future offenses, and um, and then when they complete the program they you know they've completed it successfully so we get pre-charge cases which means we get direct referrals from the police so it never even goes to the state's attorney um, we get referrals for people who have been adjudicated and are on probation um, we get um, referrals directly from the state's attorney um, we also work with the schools to some degree um, we have people in the community just call us because they're having a conflict with their neighbor. So our yeah. conflict assistance program, help, we can do mediation for them. Um, we work with, the, again, with the school district doing some mediation occasionally. Um, we also work with people coming out of incarceration to help them be successful in the community. So we have circles of support and accountability for those folks. And we have a transitional housing program. And then we have a, a part-time staff person who works directly with the people who've been affected by crime. So that's, that's a lot. That <laughs> we do more than that too, but that's the, in a nutshell. Um, I have a question. Are you, are you a, a city organization? I mean, are you funded by the city or? How? <laughs> we, we get a significant, a significant amount of in-kind contribution from the city, including, uh, so we're a grant funded program and the city provides us with our offices, um, use of uh, copiers, the finance, finance department processes our grant for us and does all the accounting for us. Um, I, I'm supervised by Cameron and Bill and um, and I'm sure there's more. <laughs> I'm sure there's more. So it's it's a significant contribution. So we're basically considered a department of the city, um, and so we have a tremendous amount of support in that way. Thanks. And yeah, about how many like staff and volunteers are there total? I guess um, there are four of us. Quite the extent that you guys worked on yeah yeah there are four of us um so there's myself and um alfred mills is our re-entry coordinator so he does the transitional housing and the circles of support and accountability works with those folks pat hoffman is our victim services specialist and aaron anderson um pat works about 12 hours a week aaron anderson works 24 hours a week and she's our restorative programs coordinator so she does all of the the restorative panels and then i do the conflict assistance program and we also hire out um, a couple of different local mediators who will uh, we will hire out to do some mediation for us if i can't fit it into my schedule well thank you so much for coming and feel free to yeah please jump in at any point except for on voting and uh, share your thoughts or <laughs> feedback or reactions, Thank anything you. like that. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm here to learn. <laughs> well, I'll try to remember to, to um, give context to this um, if we are forgetting, please jump in. Um, and let's review and approve the minutes from the last meeting. So folks have pulled that up. You want to do the agenda first or? or Oh, we don't need to vote on the agenda, I thought, no. now. So no, it was just, just the, the okay. negative check of just, okay. anyone have anything to add? Any concerns with this? Cool. 
Thanks for checking. Okay. All right. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Um, I had a couple of edits. Um, how do we, which we, I think we can approve with edits, right? Yes. Um, so there are two things I saw, Michael. Um, and item seven, um, just as a factual correction, I believe the first public budget hearing was last Thursday or last Wednesday. Is that true for city council? Technically we have three. One is for the proposed and then council, per, council um, adopts it as the recommended budget of the council. And then we have two more public budget hearings. So okay. There, there's technically three, so um, I don't know how that amends your edit. Well, I mean, it's easy to amend, which, which the question is, which is correct? Is the first public hearing on the budget scheduled for the 21st or did it take place or was oh, it? Oh, no, yeah, correct. Okay, yeah, the first public budget hearing was the 6th. Tomorrow is the second one, and that's when they approve it to go to the voters in March. Sorry. So okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry. Sorry. No sorry. worries. <laughs> so it's amended to strike first and write second. Is that yes. correct? Right. Great. Um, sorry, and then, just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. One, one second. Um, I'm just strike through, and that was not a Thursday, and don't need to even mess with that so that was a Wednesday wasn't it January 6th mm -hmm. um, yes uh, okay and okay good next okay next um, item number 10 um, and if my memory is false here let me know, but what I think that this, the, the issue with um, Elizabeth Parker, the reach out was that we weren't clear on what she meant by a community survey that she had referenced. Um, and in fact, I was the one who reached out to Elizabeth to get clarification, um, which I did do. Um, that's another issue is like when I should report back on that, but um, so it wasn't necessarily about communication was about a survey, a possible survey from sustainable Montpelier that we didn't understand. And I reached out, I was asked to reach out to Elizabeth. Well, to help with the, the, the community service. So it's to help with the community survey? So, you know. Just clarification about what she meant. Clarification. Uh, was, um, While Michael's doing that, you guys know those like weird strawberry candies that all grandmas have in their houses? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, my husband bought me a bag for my birthday. <laughs> so that's if you see me doing something weird in the background, it's me eating a giant pile of these strawberry candies. Yeah, I love them and I can only I find them at those. Dollar Tree, Dollar Store. That's it. I cannot find them anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send you the Amazon link. I guarantee you. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I buy one, yeah, one package for myself, one package for my kids. I don't touch mine, <laughs> you know. I really love them. Thank you. Is today your birthday? Happy birthday. Yeah. It's coming up on the third. No tip. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I did. I made that change too. Uh, is there another? Are those the only two? Those are the only things I saw. Okay. And uh, I don't have anything uh, to change, but I uh, will ask one question: What will I do as a point person for the? Uh, you know. Let's talk about that. Yeah, because I was supposed okay. to reach out to you, and I never did. So. Okay. Here we go. You want what well, do you you want to do that now or, or no? I think no. we should we should okay. touch base offline. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so those um, but I will make a motion to okay. approve the minutes as amended. I uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Any opposed? Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the changes, Jeremy. Thank sure. you. I did not notice those. So good job. Um, so self-education and learning roundtable. So Carol, this is just an opportunity that we have to learn from each other um, on the work that we're we're doing on our anti-oppression. So our you know anti-racism, anti-classism, you know just learnings that we're doing that we want to share. So it could be books you've read, conversations you've had, whatever it is. Um, it's just kind of an, an open space. Well, I, I participate. I, I was in the audience for um, a, a program sponsored by the League of Women Voters on mental oh, health yeah. and policing, um, and um, that was uh, that was helpful to to get some to find out what other other places are doing and, and uh, questions of uh, presentations by um, the chief um, and by someone who is in I'm in Rutland who is. Um, it's a, it's a kind of an outreach, you know, people who, who themselves have had mental problems or you know, problems in the past service mentors to other pe to people who are uh, dealing with those. And what was the third one? Um, uh, oh, um, I, I had my notes here somewhere, but I've forgotten. Anyway, it was it was really helpful, and um, the, the, I I did get to hear some other models about um, the way the police interact and uh, and and use um, um, outside resources for dealing with uh, mental health issues as part of their police calls. And Chief talked a little bit more about. Um, the arrangement with uh, Washington County Mental Health for having a um, um, someone who is specifically assigned to work with the, with the police. I think that uh, that was uh, filmed, Orker may uh, filmed, and so I think it will be available uh, because it was done as part of the the Kellogg Hubbard Library programming. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, and Michael, if you have the link, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing it, so I can put it in the newsletter as well. Okay, I'll. I I'll, know, but I, I will I'll keep my out. eyes out too from Porch Forum. Okay. Um. Ah, our camera just got it at her fingertips. Great. Um. No, that was something different. Sorry. Oh, great. <laughs> I wanted to share. Um, I had recently had a conversation with the Reverend at Christ Church, and they were talking about the new bishop. And I had heard about her, but I wanted to do more reading. Uh, Vermont had, um, or, well, I don't I don't know what to, anyway, the Vermont um, bishop for the Episcopal Church was ordained um, 2019, and she's the first um, black bishop that Vermont has had. So I was doing some reading about her and what she stands for. Um, and she had written a very interesting letter, um, sort of social justice. And so I, I included that link. And I thought that was really interesting. So she's worth researching. She has some very, um, her work really aligns with what y'all are doing, so. Thank you. Um, I'll share that um, recently, so I, I worked in, in the Hardwick area for uh, many years and was part of a group called Community Allies for Safety, Trust, and Respect, and I'm still on their uh, email distribution list, and they started a, a book discussion group um, on a book called CAST, C-A-S-T-E, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and um, we I, I attended uh, the first um, they had met once before and talked about what their format was going to be. And I attended that first book discussion last night, and uh, which was really great because 
I mean, I learned some things, some, you know, from a historical perspective, things that I didn't really understand about, um, I mean, I know what caste is and where it exists, but, but didn't really look at it as how it applies in the United States and historically how that, how it was set up and how laws were created around, um, you know, keeping, keeping this system in place and with how, how it relates specifically to um, to race and uh, black and brown people. So that was really great. And, you know, it was really expansive in my thinking. And one of the things that struck me the most in the first part of the book that we read was that um, Nazi Germany actually used the United States um, as a model to, de to develop what they were doing um, with the Jews, and um, and that just it, it just it it increased my shame and guilt about being um, an American, and um, you know I recognize that I I wasn't personally responsible for that, but um, really just shown a different light on who we are and where we are, and um, and how much work we have to do to to fix it. Um, I think I mentioned this book last uh, one time back. I have a copy if anyone wants to borrow it. Um, yeah, I, I read it. So just let me know, and I'll and we can arrange to, you know, get it to you one way or another. So. I feel like this book just keeps popping up, so I think yeah. I'm gonna have to read it. <laughs> You're not the yeah. Okay, let let me know where. Cool. Let me know where I, I know. Get it to you. We'll post it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is obvious, perhaps, since we celebrated the memorial for Martin Luther King on Monday, but I, I have been spending more time um, listening, reading, thinking about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so I did, again, watch the, the I Have a Dream speech that he gave at the March on Washington in 1963, um, which might be unremarkable, except honestly, I don't remember watching that speech until I watched it the first time, maybe a few months ago. I, did, of course, I've heard snippets of it, but never recalled being shown it in any of my public schooling education or beyond. Um, so seeing it for the first time, you know, after doing some other work along kind of anti-racism it was a very powerful experience um and then watching it again uh you know a week or so ago after the you know the insurrection at the capitol also another powerful experience um just to hear the power of his poetry i mean he's a, a preacher poet um very moving um the way he talked about the power of imagination to envision a thing, a world that seems impossible that we can't possibly imagine. Um, so it was, it was a very kind of inspiring thing for me personally, just to, to experience um, and then just connect so much um, about why we're doing, you know, work on this committee and then other things that we're doing. Um, a interesting little fact about that speech that I, um, heard um, and kind of learning more about it. Um, his prepared marks did not include the whole I have a dream second half of that speech. So he had written some prepared marks, um, which is, you know, the first several minutes. Um, and the story goes that Mahalia Jackson was in the audience with him on the dais and she yelled out to him, Tell him about the dream, Martin. And that kicked him into this, what is the most famous sections of the, the speech about, you know, I have a dream and, and kind of listing out what that dream meant to him. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing speech, amazing story. Um, still so important for this time. Um, so I don't know if you've seen it recently or listened to it recently, but um, I, I really recommend um, going to it, you know, especially if you're having, you know, a lack of 
hope or faith or whatever it might be. I think it's a, it's an amazing reminder of the kind of world we're trying to build. So. And just similarly, I just want, it was like, this is so obvious, but the inauguration today and just, you know, hearing in the, in the, in the speech, you know, naming of like white supremacy and like calls for racial justice. And that I just show, just showing like how much work has been done the past four years and particularly gearing up this summer to like put that, you know, put that in past four years, past, you know, 12 years past 400 years to, you know, put that, put that in, um, to, to get that named in the inauguration. And just like that, the first actions will be like reversing the Muslim ban and expanding the eviction moratoriums and, um, things like that it just feels, feels really powerful to name today. So, um, um, I'll add one final, one more thing, uh, anticlimactic, but related to what, to what uh, Jeremy was talking about. I uh, participated as the moderator of a, a program um, sponsored by um, the, the Montpelier Senior Activities Center and uh, the Council on Aging. Um, it was mostly with AmeriCorps and VISTA volunteers. And the topic was uh, obviously related to aging, but we focused in on um, on uh, aging in place and food security and food food security. Um, and it was interesting to hear. Um, there were there were three of us who were seniors <laughs> um, who were able to talk about our experience aging in place and uh, and then a little bit about the about food. Um, but it was also interesting to hear what the what the AmeriCorps and Vista people are doing, working with uh, elderly people who are living alone. Uh, it's not a it's not a, a constituency that's been on our radar very much. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, and I'm not sure you know what we have to to say that, that uh, uh, about it, or if we want to try to include it. But it was interesting to take this, take into account mm -hmm. some of the anecdotal stuff that, that people are talking about about why people don't you know aren't eating well or why people who are living alone fail to you know thrive and and, and to some extent how they thrive. But, so, um, I, as I say, I was just the moderator, but um, but it was it was a very interesting. And there are some resources that were that were identified, and I can pass them along if um, or if, if anyone wants them, I'll do that. Um, I'm in the newsletter. Thing to include in your newsletter, Shana. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Cool. Well, maybe we back and transition us to other just report backs from other city committees as well. So, um, you know, anything to know about the budget with the meeting tomorrow, uh, hearing from your conversation with Elizabeth Parker, Jeremy, and mm -hmm. on the police and schools meeting with Pizza from Michael. Whoever mm -hmm. wants to start. Nothing specific with the budget. There was only one change from the last public hearing. The council voted to include a $20,000 um, addition to go to the capital area neighborhoods, which is great. They've been a great partner um, in getting the word out and communicating for us in avenues that we can't reach people with, like um, for things that need a personal touch. Person to person helps us really expand our communication past the internet. Um, that does have a slight uh, tax um, implication, um, not a lot, but you know we came in mm -hmm. at. Um, no tax increase, and they've added some things that have incrementally raised the tax rate, but not a significant amount. It was only $20,000. So um, that's really the only update we'll hear tomorrow if they want to um, add anything else. I haven't heard, knock wood, of, of anybody um, last minute petitioning. Um, I only say that because I, I really want to know first, you know, <laughs> I want to know what's going on. Um, so it'd be interesting if anything does show up tomorrow, but tomorrow's the last day to be petitioned to put on the ballot. So we'll see. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't heard of any other um, interest for putting anything else up. So that's my budget update. Sorry. Okay. Jeremy, do you want to share more about um, Talk about Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 
played back and forth. So I just spoke with her this morning. Um, so you recall, we were a little bit unsure about what Elizabeth had meant when she started talking about a possible community survey for Montpelier um, because she referenced a few different things. She referenced um, a, a community survey that was recently done in Barrie. Um, and she also mentioned that in the past, Montpelier has done, I think a 10 year, every 10 year survey, which they did not do in 2019 when I think it was up to be, was meant to be done. That's correct. Um, yeah. So I, I just asked her like, well, what, what, do you, what were you talking about specifically? So um, there's not really anything there, there right now. I think it, it's her notion, you know, as a staff person for Sustainable Montpelier that she would like to do some kind of a community-wide survey um, that is, you know, online, so easily accessible, um, that, you know, really kind of digs in with residents about, you know, what's important to them um, at this time about, you know, the city and community itself. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's really nothing determined. There's no plans. There's no conversation with the city about doing this. Um, if she, she said, if they were to do it, you know, it would be in collaboration with, you know, various committees in the city like ours and also other city departments, but um, there is nothing in the works around a community survey from from sustainable Montpelier. Got it. And did you did they have like specific questions they wanted to put in the survey even or that we were doing? Well, she kept talking not about even yet, not yet. No, not yet. I mean, I think yeah. I asked her if she can get a hold of the Barry City survey that she shared with us because it sounds like that's a model for her. Um, and I haven't seen the 10 year survey that the city has done. It, I think it's not, from her perspective, the city survey that's been done, um, she used the word sterile. I think there are some more meatier issues that she would like to get into um, with a survey, this a new survey that she's thinking about, but she didn't get into any specifics. I know she's, she's very focused on kind of economic justice um, and kind of class issues. Um, so I, I assume um, some of that would be in it. But yeah, no specifics. Michael, do you want to talk about the policing? Yep. Okay, so Keisha Ram uh, did attend a part of the um, the last meeting of the police review committee, um, explained what the pro the project that uh, they're doing for us is about, and had some discussion of methodology. Um, the the we in turn explain to her what our committee is doing and uh, that our interest in um, getting some information from the small group discussion or the focus group discussion groups about um, attitudes and experiences and thoughts on police, the police and policing as, as separate as somewhat different issues. And, and Keisha uh, agreed that this would be okay. Um, um, we, the, we as a committee had drafted a few questions and um, we appointed um, one of our members, uh, Dan T Towell, to be liaison to Keisha. And he, pass, he has, has or will be passing those questions to her and she and her colleagues will vet them and then let us know in the police review committee um, if she wants to you know, revise them, have different questions, what, what's gonna happen. But she was agreeable to devote some time uh, in their conversations with um, the different focus groups to police, policing and, pol and police and the Montpelier police specifically. So that's good. And um, as things develop, I'll keep you informed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Um, so moving into great segue, good good order, note itself, um, for talking about the creative discourse work plan update. Um, so Carol, uh, we, you know, we have hired this um, Carol and listeners at home through Orca. Um, we have hired creative discourse as a consultant to help us identify what are the major issues and that we need to address in uh, as a city um, to 
make it more equitable and just um, and welcoming um, to all in particular, you know, focusing on um, folks of, you know, marginalized or oppressed identities. And so um, we are doing a series of focus groups with, with folks um, uh, over the next few months, starting with folks in the city, um, with Black, Indigenous, people of color folks in the city, um, and we'll be doing um, uh, kind of uh, doing doing these these conversations um, that this this consultant is hiring as kind of someone from the outside, and then they'll be kind of um, pulling those into some recommendations. Um, so Michael had proposed kind of an outreach uh, document uh, and as a kind of a starting point. So just again, as a, another quick reminder, is that we um, wa don't want to be the consultants we've been working with in Essex have, have um, they've worked in Essex and they've run into some issues around um, like safety and, and transparency, right? So if you're like, okay, here's the list of everyone that we know who's a person of color who lives in this town, like that, that could be, it could be like not great to like have that be, you know, super public. And so if there, you know, is any way, you know, if you have ideas of people to do it, to send them directly to me or directly to Keisha. I um, mean, if folks, I realized not everyone had her email address. So I apologize. If you do need that, let me know. Um, and that they'll be kind of consolidating the list so that they're not um, FOIAable essentially. Um, and so, um, yeah, just as a quick reminder, so if like not, you know, saying specific names whenever possible or, um, or, or things like that. But I think what Michael had sent was great. So just as a heads up before we diving into this conversation. So take it away, Michael. Well, um, as I as I said in the cover of the letter that I when I, that I wrote sending out, I just sat down and thought about. Uh, well, I had sent a, a few of these things to Cameron, and then I realized that some of the names that um, I had put on because they were in, I thought they were in sort of in my area. The one I'm doing is the, um, the the leaders of nonprofit organizations. And then as I looked at that again, I, sh I realized I should have looked all the way down the list of nine because some of them fit better in some of those other places. So it was a bit of sorting for me, but I thought, well, this is, uh, we should, I should just throw this away and maybe it would be helpful to help others who have taken on one or another of these, these uh, focus groups to just sort of get it on a list and people can start adding to the list. And uh, Cameron alerted me that it's not, it can't be a reply to all. So I volunteered that you can send them all to me and I'll add, I'll keep adding to this list and we put putting names into the appropriate uh, categories. And at some point, bring it back to the committee and said, here's what all of you have suggested. suggested. Um, and I hope, you know, the idea was, well, maybe it'll, you know, it'll give those of you who've taken on different other ones, some starting points, if you haven't already thought about them. And um, this is what you can do when you're retired and you have nothing else to do with your life. So, um, yeah, nothing else. You're not nothing doing anything, else. Michael. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, um, you know, it was just, just a way of getting it, getting this pushed off, you know, giving it a little shove to get it started. And if it's useful to you, fine. If it's not, we'll, um, since the, your your previous comment, uh, uh, Shana, about safety and an anonymity, um, that is a complication that I hadn't thought about in this. Oh, that's why I thought you were reaching out to me initially. So oh. no. Well, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I mean, if if we don't want to have a list that's circulating even among the the six or seven of us. Uh, but that you really want to be the one person who collects, uh, especially names of individuals who would or would not want to be uh, identified publicly. I mean, this is not, I don't, this, I guess, if, uh, does it become a public document, Cameron? If So here's the thing. We've contracted with Keisha. She is and her group are not government agencies. So that, that's one of the reasons that it's important to have these sort of things handled by a consultant. Because yeah, if I created a list of who was in being involved, that could be considered a public document. So she's has taken care of that for us. That's their job and that's their role and that's them to protect the, the uh, anonymous nature and the, the protected nature of these, these conversations. So, you know, my approach to this was to reach out to 
groups like organizations and then they can figure out between themselves who they're going to invite right um if they like what would do an open call to their folks we, that's not us to decide right so if we do as much outreach to groups as possible and then just pass that information to Keisha, then we won't have to worry about it right mm. i think that's, and that's probably what yeah. Like for your, your document, Michael was like, this is a person who is like known to be the convener of, you know, right. the Black Lives and, Matter March or whatever yeah, it is. Right. right. And, and, so and, not... and as I'm looking at this list again, um, they are, most of them are directors or people of agencies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are, there are a few here that are individuals whom I know or know about um, who are not in that category and and uh, I can take those off my list and send them to Keisha um, and then uh, and then um, I guess the, the you yeah, know it looks especially the group five the BIPOC residents and the LGBT um, uh, plus um, the rest of them are uh, organized people who are involved with organizations um, so I'll, I'll do that. I will delete those folks from my list and send the names to mm -hmm. directly to, to key, send them directly to Keisha. That's the best way to do this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but does, yeah, does this spark any other questions or comments or ideas from folks for discussion? Yeah. So, so I guess I'll sort of cut in because I've been doing a lot of work with the staff and, um, yeah. I volunteered last time to reach out to the LGBTQIA community, and I have spoken to quite a few folks um, that uh, they want us to just set a time and date and they'll invite people, right? I think that's the the rub I've been coming into is like, I, I, I just want to sure that the <laughs> creative discourse can, can be there, right? And, you know, I do intend to have these things over Zoom. So right now I'm working with staff to schedule the meetings. Um, I did have a clarifying question, Shana. I was, I was copying on a few um, emails with Creative Discourse and I just don't understand. I'm, I'm just not clear on who they wanna meet with. They, like how many meetings do they wanna have with staff? Cause they were saying two, but they meet with three different groups. So I don't know what they're asking for, honestly. <laughs> time if they want to meet with my um you know uh blacks like folks in my that i that work for me or do they want to work do they want to meet with them separately or do they want to meet with them with their you know, departments or so i'm just not sure yeah so, we and that's it. and it was confusing by email and i think yeah. that would be like when we're talking let's just like like get that figured out and so we haven't figured out a time that we can talk either this week or next week yet. But if we do, can, can we just invite you in? And if you can make it, or like, can we schedule a meeting that you can make too? Yeah. Yeah. Just whenever it works for y'all, and then I'll jump in. Um, just because I don't want to tell my staff, you know, set up for this time if they don't even want to speak with them. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So that's ready to go anytime, though. Um, you know, we've identified yeah. that would be involved. We have, um, I have my set groups and the folks that I spoke to and a couple different organizations. Let me pull that up. Right, Vermont, the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont, and then Universal Unitarian Church has a group. So that's what I've talked to so far. It's pretty large organizations. So ready to go. Awesome. Um, Cameron, the, the group you're in touch with at the Unitarian Church, if I understand right, it would probably include quite a few young people. Um, so that might be an interesting kind of, you know, um, double fit for them in terms of the people they'd like to talk to, if we're thinking of the same group. Um, it was the Unitarian Church welcoming group. Nancy Schultz. Yeah. Okay. 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 There's a, there is a different youth oriented group I'm thinking of. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks.
And then I'm sorry it took me so long to get the sample language, but I did include that in my email that I sent out. So if you are, you know, if you're looking for some some sort of sample language, that would be really helpful. Uh, I think that could be helpful. Um, but in it, they also have this stipend language. And so um, I didn't know, I have not moved on like figuring out what we can stipend people. We have, um, so as you guys know, uh, so maybe I'll just move us into the, to the fundraising and money talk, um, unless there's anything else to talk about here with, you know, organizing the meetings or, or scheduling the meetings. Um, so I think we still have a, oh, go ahead. Cameron. Oh, I just had a question about the stipend situation. So do they still, Great. does creative discourse still want to put that on the table when most of these will be Zoom related? Like how, how yeah. do we, I don't know, I, that seems uh, uh, something different to me. Like I understand like incentives, right? Like gift cards, that kind of thing, like what we talked about before, right? Yep. But um, I think that that there's some interesting things that we talked about, like childcare and whatever. Like, do we still how how deep do y'all want to go with that? I think that's a decision that you'll have to make um, about what you want to offer for support for like a Zoom meeting versus like an in-person meeting. And that that just might be a conversation point that you yeah. have creative discourse. I don't know. Well, and I can just say from my experience, as you guys know, I'm working with Keisha in my work capacity on the environmental justice policy project. And we've been still stipending people um, during, while meeting on Zoom, because recognizing that it's still taking people away from their jobs or that they're gonna have to order dinner, not make it because they're on this call or just like recognizing that it is still like a burden and wanting to be able to compensate people for their time. Um, and for that that work um, of participating in this in the in the same way, and so right while it's like 150 for in person is what they have here, and I think yeah for the project that we've been working on it's been like 40 to 50 dollars I think for for you know compensating people for that, but you know that's that's thinking that it's including not just the meeting but also like yeah me calling them up and being like okay and like can you invite five of your friends and then they call up ten of their friends in order to recruit five people to come you know so it's just like kind of compensating for, for all of that work. Um, I Right, so we do have, we have about uh, $2,718 in the bank. We have another $3,000 committed. Um, and then I did just send in, to, in an additional application for, I can't remember how much it was, Michael, was it 5,000 from the that's, Acorn Foundation? That's, that's right. Yeah, um, so we had a goal of getting $12,000 uh, fundraised from, uh, you know, not from the city to, to get us to that $22,000 before kind of the start of these meetings. And so we're not there yet, but we, we are moving along pretty, pretty good. And those $700 that we've raised from individuals in particular is, is in particularly useful because it doesn't, there, there's no like grant deliverable or anything associated with that. So we can use those to use as um, incentives or stipends for participation. Um, and then, um, uh, golly, what Mount Montpelier Live has also offered, you know, working with Montpelier businesses to, um, to be able to offer some sort of like incentives as the form of gift cards or raffle prizes or, you know, something, something um, you know, maybe a little, little bit more local and tangible to compensate people for, for their time. And so we just haven't really talked about this yet as, as a group, but um, so yeah, just first of all, does anyone have any questions about like our budget and, and how kind of where we're at? And then um, yeah, like how should, uh, does anyone have any thoughts about how to do the budget and yeah, or the, the stipends and compensation? I mean, I, I agree with you, Shana. I think it's important to compensate people um, for their time and their contributions. Um, I guess um, I would rely on creative discourse to help gauge what the appropriate amount is, kind of just in terms of past precedent. Um, of course, working within our budget. Um, so I don't have necessarily an opinion about what the amount is, um, but I do think it's important that we offer some stipend. Is that to everybody who participates or, yeah, okay. No, no, good question. I was nodding because I was thinking. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, what do you guys think? Like for staff, I'm thinking particularly about for staff, right? If this is like 
part of their job working in the city, would that be appropriate to offer compensation for, for staff? Not for my staff, no, because I'd be scheduling that on a work day or within their extended hours that they get paid to be there. That's not a thing. Yeah. No, no, no. And so then we, for other meetings too, just because there, it can be some like weird, like class stuff coming up and so that we, you know, really so that people don't feel like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to take this. We would be like, no, this is what everyone who is here is getting. And if you don't want it or you don't need it, like donate it, give it, give it, you know, give it back to us, whatever it is. But like, as part of this process, like, you know, give it to the food bank. Like we are if you are coming to the meeting, we are doing this, you know, it's like, you don't have to like ask for it. Like it's, it's a, it's a clear, you know, set of what, what's going to be happening. Um, but yeah, except for people who are being paid otherwise to participate. Cool. But yeah, so just ask creative discourses. Yeah. And, and um, any other, any other thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Anything else around our kind of work plan and updates there or move on to other business? Uh, well, I'll just let you know that um, um, I'm running out of options here on my list of uh, that I developed from the big thick book because almost everyone I uh, have contacted one way or, or done more research requires a 501c3 status. And um, I had I looked at the Gill Foundation, which meant, mentioned in their on their website that they had given to state agency gifts 4.76% of their funds. So I, uh, they are by invitation only. So I sent an email and I got a phone conversation back and he said, no, you have to have 501c3. So I don't know how they did a, how they gave money to uh, government agencies if that's their requirement, but he was pretty clear um, that that's a, that is a requirement. So I'm down to, I think my last two on my on, on the list where I haven't made any contacts yet. One is the Rod Roderick MacArthur Foundation um, in Illinois, and they don't even have a website. So I have to, I'll have to give them a phone call. Um, it, it doesn't sound as if they're really interested in giving away money, but all right. Um, <laughs> And the, the other one is the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, which is a big foundation. And um, I, haven't done the, I haven't done the web search yet to see if we're gonna run into that. So I'm thinking that our, oh, there's also the Annenberg Foundation. Um, so I'm thinking that, you know, we, we may need to be starting to take seriously the possibility of talking to people in the community uh, trying to identify people in the community who might be interested. Um, I've made a tentative um, stab at it with one person I know who is well connected to other people who have who also have uh, um, means and interests in social uh, social equity. But I think um, you know we're, we're all going to have to sort of decide whether we really want to go and start not you know calling in whatever f chips of friendship or or you know good works we've done with other people to see if they're willing to, to come back to you know to, to us it, it you know it's a it's an, another job for our committee and different from what we probably any of us signed up for but uh, if i think i think we're facing the the reality that that's a, that if we're going to make this goal we may have to we may have to do that and I'll put that on my list of things to talk about with creative discourses as well, because they had some good ideas at the beginning that didn't pan out for us, but that maybe they can do, do more for that, like do introductions to, to who's, you know, funded them to work in Burlington and Essex and Winooski and um, because, right, it's just, it's, that's so frustrating. And thank you for doing all that work, Michael. Um, well, I mean, yeah, some of it's, it's just time at the, at the computer, but some of it, you know, has been, you know, te playing telephone tag and, uh, right. and, it's, and it's interesting. So, okay. You're welcome. <laughs> cool. All right. Other business, um, Jeremy, do you want to, uh, kick us off with kind of just protests and, and policings and like, 
potential um, committee comment? Yeah. Um, so I emailed Shana earlier this week about a couple of things that came up for me. And the thread with them is they involve the police department. Um, and so I'm offering them up really as for discussion. Um, again, being new to the committee, I'm not sure what our purview is and I'm not sure what precedent has been, um, but I just thought of our work um, as, as these two things came up for me. Um, so the first has to do with the budget. Uh, did anyone attend the January 6th public budget session? Um, there was quite a, there was a good turnout of folks from the public speaking about the 10%, near 10% increase in the police department budget for this coming fiscal year. Um, you know, the, the main point is in this time of austerity, when other programs are being cut or you know, eliminated, is it in our best interest to increase the budget for the police department? Um, that was the basic gist of a number of comments that came up. Um, and so I was curious if that is something we wanted to discuss as a committee. Um, we've done some work to kind of give a tool to the council on the, on the budget. Um, and as we think about equity, and, and as our charge, you know, dictates, um, do we want to discuss that and take a stand? I think what, with that particular discussion at council, I was a little bit, I was not impressed with the response from the city manager or a few of the council members and the mayor, um, which left a, kind of a bad taste in my mouth after viewing um, the kind of resultant discussion. Um, so by way of proposal, I guess, you know, a proposal that we could make as a committee is given the optics of austerity and an increase in policing and a larger context, the larger conversation around policing in the country, would we recommend that the police department budget stay completely flat? However, that is done, I do not know. I don't know the details of the budget. So let me shed some light on this real quick because I, I, we're really working against ourselves here a little bit. There was not, okay, so the way the budget kind of fell out this year is there is a visible increase to the police budget, but it's not actually an increase to the police budget. So bear with me for a second. What happened is, is one of our funds is decimated. A lot of our funding comes from something we call the parking fund, right? People put into the parking meters, we get money for tickets. Um, you know, there's a lot of different funding streams that come into the parking budget. A lot of our jobs were paid out of the parking budget, right? So my job uh, was allocated to the parking budget. It's just another revenue stream. And so all of us whose jobs touch parking gets paid out of the parking budget. It's gone, basically. We turned everything off, there's no money. And so we needed to take all of the little portions that were, um, uh, that have been paid out from the parking fund and move them to the general fund or otherwise people weren't gonna get paid, right? So for my instance, like my budget, the city manager's budget, a lot of the police budget was stirred by something that's not in the general fund. It was another fund. Mm -hmm. We had to take all of that money that was in the parking fund budget pot and move it into the general fund seeing is an increase but that increase just existed out of other funds so it looks like an increase we actually decreased the amount of police officers that we're funding this year by an entire police officer when you only have 17 that's a huge deal so we cut an entire position and most of the money that you see is an increase for police um, not only is it the salaries and the parking but it's also for our dispatchers worked to make sure that our dispatch team is up and they did new equipment. And so um, one thing that we weren't like, they're on our list of priorities for our um, capital fund because those things are important. Right now we have old radios and old consoles and all those things need to be upgraded, right? 
So I don't think maybe we did a very good job presenting why it looks that way. I don't, I agree with you. I do not think we presented that correctly because it does make sense to be mad that there's an increase, like a visible increase in the police budget. And it's just because we moved money that didn't exist anymore. We had to pay it out of the general fund now because there's no other way it's coming in. And so we didn't do a very good job communicating that, but it is a misconception that we added more money to their budget. All we did was, was take money that was supposed to be coming from over here and we moved that to the general fund. So it, I, I, I can't remember, but so, yeah. oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I wasn't at the meeting. And so, um, is the funds coming, um, like, but this is for next year's budget. And so it's assuming that we won't be able to get any funds in from parking or from other places for that future budget. Cause right. aren't those, aren't those revenue sources back in? Not really. No. Uh, it's, it's our parking budget right now, to be honest with y'all has, barely covered the people that maintain our facility, like our parking facilities. Right. So the people who- but, And that won't be back by 2022, you think? Yeah. Or you're not, you're not budgeting on that. Okay. We are not budgeting on that. We think that- And that, then if it does, then would that go to other places or would that then go to the general fund? If, is that like no longer bookmarked for the police? Yeah, we're, we're figuring that out. Um, right, it's no longer bookmarked for the police. We don't know what we would do with that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there is a plan, but um, I don't know if I, what to tell you about that right now. If the parking fund does recover, a lot of that we might be able to shift back. Like if the parking fund recovers enough, we might be able to shift all the things that we move to the general fund back to the parking fund to take the pressure off the um, general fund. But there has been conversation about re-looking at what the parking fund is used for. Um, before, it, when it was conceptualized years and years and years ago, it was for things like fixing roads and um, really working on capital projects instead of paying people, right? And that's probably where we should be back to. It makes more fiscal sense to have the parking fund do things like that. So, uh, Jeremy, I don't, I didn't mean to be adversarial. It's just, it's something that I, I just want to be very clear that we didn't add anything. We just moved things. And so it, it's a bad, it's a bad year to do that. It's a bad year to do that without a robust conversation about it. And I don't think we've had that robust conversation because, because we, because we didn't add, we actually cut quite, a, quite a lot from them. So all of their equipment, they're not getting any new equipment, really um, all their cars, an entire officer. We, they, they put a lot on the table to be so it, it's a bizarre time to have. Um, so that's my explanation of what is actually happening within that budget. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Is there a plan for communicating this information more widely to the public? You know, I, I, it's a conversation that I've been having with Bill and it's sort of the budget is his thing. So, um, you know, that's a continued conversation I'm having with him. Yeah, I think, no, I really appreciate that, Cameron. Um, I think it had a lot to do with presentation. Um, you know, I'm, and these issues are complicated too, so it's, they're not easy to like wrap your head around, especially for someone like me who doesn't understand budgets at all. Um, so I, whatever leverage you have, I think, you know, helping that story get told differently. I mean, the part of the problem was if that, if it had been a kind of clear mechanical justification like that, I could, it may have gone over better. The council's response, they should have led with that in their response too. Instead, they kind of, and I wish Lauren was here because I hate to talk about council without her here, but <laughs> it was a very condescending response in a lot of ways. Like, oh yeah, let's just keep talking about it, but we're not gonna do anything really or really address your concerns public who are commenting on this issue. Um, so it, it kind of like that muddled it even further. It was like, oh, we don't want to touch it, but thanks for talking about it. Um, so there were a lot of perceptions flying around that, you know, first, you know, certainly it triggered me a little bit as I was listening and watching, but yeah. I wonder if anyone else has any feelings to, to share. 
Well, I think also just like in this national context of, you know, defunding police, you know, nationally, right? And having it be specifically be the police that looks like the budget is increasing um, is, is, is important. So, yeah. That's my, say, sorry, I was diving in. Carol, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say that um, I happen to be on the email distribution list for the uh, Showing Up for Restored uh, Racial Justice group. And just a couple days ago, they sent, uh, sent an email out that is asking for people to take action based on that 10% increase in, um, in the police budget. And so Cameron, it was really great to hear your explanation about that because I wasn't aware of that and I attend the budget meetings for the city. So, um, so that, you know, really wasn't clear. And, you know, basically they're, they want to, reduce funding for police and, and divert those those funds elsewhere. But just FYI, you know, that group is also on that on that bandwagon right now. Uh, Cameron, would it help you in your conversations with Bill if our committee requested clarification on this issue um, and requested that the clarification be um, uh, public, you know, clarification to through the public. I mean, I don't want to start pulling the rug under out from the bill and and the council, but um, if we're if it's unnecessarily creating a, a problem or creating a problem which is, is you know is completely missed, you know upside down, uh, I think it would be in their best interest to hear from us who had to hear it from you that you know we're concerned about this. And we and we think clarification is important for, for just the reasons that you know we we uh, we put before them this this tool for looking at the uh, equity and, and social justice. I mean, we want to help here. I think rather than just squawk. <laughs> I am actually as you're talking. I was typing an email to Bill, really strongly advocating for a, even like a graphic depiction of like. Here's where you know. Here's where the money was. Here's where it's coming from, and here's why. Because I, I think we've really stepped over that and just assumed that folks had a, a like the same intimate knowledge of the budget that I have, right? And, and I really do appreciate this feedback and hearing from you guys because I, you know, there's always learn learning curves with anything, and and really how we communicated this could have been different. So, you know, I appreciate hearing that, and um, I am. I am de definitely name dropping this committee if that <laughs> um, to my in my communication with Bill. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. I think having like some more of that that future thinking I think would be helpful too because I think I'm also the thing like I'm like well 2022 like of course the parking budget's going to be back and also it probably doesn't make sense that the parking budget is paying for a police force like that does not like one to one equate. Um, and so like, but to, uh, so I've also just like, I, that's, those are like where my follow-up questions are going that I also like would like to have answered. And so I recognize this meeting is tomorrow. And so there probably won't be consensus on those yet, but of just like recognizing that those, those are all, those are all part of are the same question, I think. Yeah. So I think the, the, the short and long answer to that is that, um, you know, the parking fund was just a very steady revenue stream that the city could count on. And so um, uh, that helps. So anything that we can do that protects what comes out of the general fund protects taxes, if that makes sense. So if we don't have to raise the general fund allocations for what it's paying for, we don't have to raise, like there's no tax um, uh, change, right? So if we can pay people out of a fund, not the general fund, and take the pressure off the general fund, it doesn't impact taxes. And with such a small, uh, uh, t town, you know, city that we live in, taxes are a big deal here. Like, you know, where I lived in Mecklenburg County had over a million people. Taxes, you could do a $5 million thing and over the, you know, years that's pennies on the dollar for people, but here there's like less than 8,000 people. So anything that we can do to take pressure off the general fund is important. Um, so anybody who sort of touched parking in any, any capacity got some of their funding through the parking fund right? So we could take that pressure off the general fund. And so um, 
you know, it came out of a place of trying to be um, responsive to the taxpayer. And I think, you know, you know, how do you anticipate something like this happening? So it is, it is an interesting, like what's the phrase, never waste an emergency. It's a very interesting look at how our town plans the, for things like the parking fund in the future. So I think that's a good point. Other thoughts here? Cool. Well, I've got it on my calendar to go tomorrow. So I'm excited to actually have it on my calendar this time. Because I I'll be there too. For, I'll be there too for other reasons. Um, oh, cool. There you go. Um, anything else, Jeremy? Um, no, I think there was another issue I thought to raise, but I think. Um, Looking at time, we'll let that one go for maybe next time or me next. Time. Yeah, cool. Um, and my only other thing here too was just website updates. I say I forget who raised this, but just that our website is very out of date with just the members on it and with um, it doesn't have anything about the projects that we're going through. Um, and maybe like a link to our um our newsletter sign up or just like just having updated information essentially. Um, and so I could do that, but seeing how far behind I am on so many other things, I wanted to see if anyone wanted to volunteer to kind of write up that new language to send to the city, um, just to update our website. I'm I kind of looking at you, Michael, as the writer, but you were avoiding eye con computer eye contact. So I'm taking notes. <laughs> um, no, I know, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I would prefer not to take on another writing project. Okay. At this point. I can, I yes. can take on some writing. <laughs> You're amazing. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and then, Michael, you, who is, who, do we know who to send it to to get the website updated? Just send it to me. I'll forward it to, to Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, I got you. Perfect. So let me be clear. We want to update the members, and we want a blurb about the work with Creative Discourse. And a link to the newsletter, I think. You mean sign up? Like join newsletter. us. Yeah. Type of thing. Cool. Can you get that to me? Um, yeah. Cool. And then also just a quick plug for remembering to recruit for the committee. Lots of open seats. Um, all right. Our last thing on our agenda is of talking about time. So proposal from Pellin to meet mornings um, on what we had met with met before for like since for, for COVID. Um, I think before that too was 8.30 to 10 on Wednesday mornings. And so um, maybe we can start with that time and see if that time works for folks, if we'd prefer to move into back to back to Wednesday mornings. Works for me now. But uh, fall, next fall, I am teaching Wednesday and my class starts 10, which means I need to leave the house like around nine. <laughs> yeah. So were we meeting 8.30? I remember 7.30 to nine. No? Okay, sorry. Maybe I just, yeah, I'm confused. Oh, I can't time. imagine I did anything before eight o'clock. Did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is eight to nine thirty, is it? I don't remember really, but it is fine for me now. Wednesday, eight thirty to ten. Yeah, I can I can do eight thirty to ten on Wednesdays. I can I can too, but I think in September um, I may be um, going back to work at uh, Mangy's Bakery because uh, Steve Stouffer is going to be having back surgery, and. He'll be out for quite a while, and um, that means that I'm on their substitute list, and uh, I've already agreed that I would do more work there. So depending on the day, um, I, you know, there was no schedule yet, but it may be that it becomes impossible for me to do early morning because that's when we do the baking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Morning, uh, it's well, out. And it's out. Knowing that that's when Pellin is also going back um, to not being won't be able to do Wednesday mornings. Maybe can we do this like till 
late like reevaluate this late August and I guess kind of looking at you Cameron like is that kosher to kind of move our time around like that like do other committees do that is that uh some do and some don't um it's okay to do that as long as we announce when you're meeting and as long right. as you're on top of um uh, notifying folks and doing the correct procedures there. So I will endeavor. No, I'm kidding. I will, uh, okay, it's probably not like best practice to change our meeting time around all the time, but it's like, if that's a time that will generally work better for folks. Um, and you know, that works for Lauren before. So I know that we'll likely work with her for her now. Uh, so that means your next meeting would be uh, the third at eight to 9.30? For eight, eight thirty to ten. Is that? Oh, I can't. I can't. I can't. Listen, apparently. So I'm sorry. No, I. I'm sorry. No, eight. Does eight to nine thirty work for us? No. So eight thirty to ten is fine. I'm sorry. I just. Oh, okay. People were. Saying. I was confused. No. Okay. I've. I, it's very been on Zoom for a very long time today. And our 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 real kind of cadence for these is every two weeks from that date forward. If that I, just works. To, I just have to block yeah. my schedule at work so I don't get Put it on the Is it every two weeks or twice a week or twice a month? Oh golly. Every two weeks and then y'all kind of figure it out. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Great. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, okay so holiday or whatever. February third, then. Great. Um so next steps is I'm going to schedule a meeting with creative discourses with Cameron um, and send out that newsletter as we are always going to do connect with Helen um, about the meeting and have everyone be recruiting for for these meetings and continue doing that work any other next steps yeah. cool say, that again. Uh, say, say it again what your your not your agenda is Oh no, this is like next steps, not agenda. Wait. We've not set the no. agenda. You want, but do you next want steps? the next step to be in the meeting in the minutes? Yeah. Um, sure. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so go through it again. Scheduling, scheduling a meeting with creative discourses with Shana and Cameron. Uh, sending out the newsletter. And uh, recruit for our meetings, our upcoming meetings, and Shana and Helen connect. R E one of the meetings. Oh, and I'm going to update the website. Copy. And thank you. Update the website. I didn't have it on my list. Great. And then for our next agenda, I think it's the same agenda that we've been doing. Copy paste. So the next agenda would be um, introductions, review and approve the agenda, public comments, review and approve minutes, uh, self-education, report back, Creative discourse, outreach, other business, next steps, and close. Copy, copy paste. Cool. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Wait, wait, wait. wait oh. Just clarification on um, the next step: recruiting for the 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 first of the small group forums, right? Okay. The focus groups, yeah. Okay. Community conversations. Okay. All right. Well, and, and for the committee, that is also evergreen. Right. Okay. Alrighty. Good. All right. So we're adjourned. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Carol, Bye. for joining and for, for sharing. Yeah. So. Nice to meet you, Carol. Have a nice <laughs> week, everyone, or two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> See you all.